Welcome to chapter 9. In this chapter we are going to discuss animal parasites. This picture is actually of an organism called the guinea worm. These will infect into the lower epidermis and dermis of the skin and then have to be drawn out very slowly over time. They're actually wrapping the parasite around a stick and they'll do this over several days. Otherwise the worm will break and actually cause severe inflammation in this area. So what is a parasite? An animal parasite is an organism that is adapted to live within or on the body of another animal which is considered its host. Most of these parasites are typically not capable of free living existence, though some actually live in water environments. They all tend to have a very complex life cycle, and if you want to know any of these life cycles, if you'll go to cdc.gov and type in the name of the parasite, they will, be, they will show you the life cycle of the parasite, but we will not get into specifics on any of them. They typically live within intestinal tract or and discharge their eggs in the feces. So many of these organisms actually are vectored by what we call the fecal oral route. Therefore, transmission of many of these organisms will be favored by poor sanitation, high temperatures, high humidity. And so they typically tend to be more common in tropical areas and less frequent in the cold or temperate climates although we're going to talk about several that we do see here in southwest Missouri. Protozoans. Uh, protozoan infections, these are microscopic single-celled organisms, and many of these actually do live in water freely, such as this guy right here, which is called Inta amoeba histolytica. This is one of our free-living amoebas that live in fresh and salt water. They are common in temperate and tropical climates. This is another one that we see commonly here in the United States called Giardia lambdalae. And this is a very common uh, protozoan parasite that we see in Southwest Missouri. Like bacteria, protozoa release toxins and enzymes that destroy cells or interfere with their functions. And this organism right here is actually living in the bloodstream, hence the red blood cells, and this is Trypanosoma cruzi. So let's look at some of the diseases caused by these protozoan parasites, as well as some others. So first of all, what is this disease? First, what are these cells? Well, these cells are red blood cells, but what you'll see is there is something inside a number of these. In fact, this one actually has three of these organisms. So, this is actually malaria. There are several malarial organisms that will be transmitted by the vector Plasmodium falciparum, Plasmodium vivox and Plasmodium malariae. One person every minute dies from malaria in the world. And as you might suspect, what we'll see is destruction of the erythrocytes that results in severe anemia. What is the vector for Plasmodium species? It is this guy, the mosquito, and primarily the Anopheles species of mosquito carry the plasmodium organisms. So far, we've not seen major numbers of Anopheles mosquitoes here in the United States, though we have now found them in the southern part of the Gulf Coast region of the US. So what is this disease? We are actually looking internally here in the rectum and this we can see that is just fecal material but you'll notice that there are some inflamed regions here and we can even see some discharge in this area right here. This is actually amoebiasis. Amoebiasis is primarily caused by this organism into amoeba histolytica. This is found in most of untreated fresh water, 
and there are some species that can even be found in salt water. So transmission of the amoeba diseases is through the fecal oral route. These inflamed areas in the colon here are where these amoeba actually insist into the mucosal lining and cause the severe enterocolitis. So one of the major clinical signs of amoebiasis is of course watery diarrhea. This disease, here we see an organism that is actually going through the cardiovascular system. It actually has a unique flagellum in which it will actually move. And what will happen is it will cause destruction of the blood cells. So this organism is actually Trypanosoma brucei. Trypanosoma brucei is the causative agent of a disease caused, called sleeping sickness. Historically, it was called African sleeping sickness because it was primarily vectored in Africa. However, what we'll see is that the vector of this organism has actually moved into other areas of the world, such as India, but this does tend to remain a tropical disease. The reason for that is the vector is this guy right here, and this is known as the tsetse fly, T-S-E-T-S-E, -E, and this is a large blood-sucking fly that we see in these tropical regions. Now this disease you may not recognize fairly easily, but these are actually fairly small organisms. And relatively on the protozoan parasites, these are very, very small. And this organism is actually causing a disease called cryptosporidiasis, caused by the organism Cryptosporidium parvum. And as the name say it says, it causes a parvo-like disease. But the parvo-like disease that I deal with in canine species is a viral disease. This is a protozoanal disease. It causes typically a severe enteritis, can cause a colitis, so inflammation of the intestinal tract. So commonly, diarrhea is going to be the clinical sign. The problem with this is Cryptosporidium parvum is resistant to chlorination. And so in these public swim areas, such as public water parks or public pools, one person, such as a child, could be shedding the Cryptosporidium parvum into the water, and the chlorination does not kill the organism. And therefore, anybody that gets some of the pool water then is infected with this organism. Now this protozoan parasite kind of is a little banana shaped structure and this is toxoplasmosis caused by the organism Toxoplasma gondii. Many people actually get toxoplasmosis and never even know it. The problem is that during pregnancy this could cause a problem in the developing fetus. One of the most common ways that a pregnant woman can get Toxoplasma gondii is through handling infected cat feces. In fact, some physicians will even say that you should simply get rid of your cats during pregnancy. Well, that's not true. Simply don't handle the cat feces, don't kiss the cat on the butt, and you'll be fine. Some of the things that toxoplasma can cause in the fetus, or in the fetus, sorry, can be uh, preterm birth, stillborn. Uh, certainly can affect the nervous system, such as in this picture with hydrocephalus. It can cause hepato. Uh, megaly or splenomegalia, and I would suspect that this baby does have both since the abdomen is very, very enlarged, can cause different forms of pneumonia, and even result in cerebral palsy. This disease, one of my favorite protozoanal parasite diseases just because I like the little organism. And this is giardiasis caused by giardia 
lambda lot. Kind of looks like it's got a little monkey face. And this is the trophozyte form, which is the living, uh, feeding, and reproducing form. Giardiasis is primarily transferred by fecal oral route. And so drinking uh, non-treated water, contaminated water, we find a lot of Giardia. This used to be more of a tropical disease, but it has moved into temperate areas. So any unfiltered water, any non-treated water can have Giardia lambda lie in it. The life straws that some people advocate for people that go out hiking, etc., will actually filter out Giardia. So if nothing else, it's good for getting rid of Giardiasis. Now this one looks familiar. This one actually also in the bloodstream, but this is actually Trypanosoma cruzii. Trypanosoma cruzii results in a disease called Chagas disease. This is transmitted by a vector which is known as the triatomine bugs or commonly referred to as the kissing bugs. We do have these bugs in uh, the United States, primarily in the southern part, but in Missouri we do see these as well. They like to bite around the face. And one of the things that they'll do is after they bite, they will defecate. If the precursor of the adult organism is in that feces, it can crawl into through the bite, a hole created by the bug, and finally work its way down into the bloodstream. I have posted a video for you under the narrated PowerPoints on Chagas's disease, since it is something that we do see here in Missouri. This is one of our sexually transmitted diseases and the only protozoal sex sexually transmitted disease. And this is trichomoniasis caused by the organism Trichomonas vaginalis. So this causes a cervicitis in females and you can see the inflamed areas where these organisms have embedded into the cervix and typically will result in a creamy purulent discharge in the female and can cause a urethritis with again a discharge in the male. This disease you're probably not very familiar with, but this is Babesiosis caused by Babesia microti. This organism actually will cause a severe anemia, very similar to malaria. And oftentimes we'll see this kind of X shape or the signet ring look uh, similar to malaria in the red blood cells. The vector again will be or the vector, I'm sorry, will be spread by the nymph stage of a particular uh, tick, and that is Ixodes scapularis, or through blood transfusions, or rarely will trichomoniasis be spread from the mother to the fetus. Again, causes a severe anemia, And the vector is Ixodes specificus or Ixodes scapularis. So both of these, uh, the adult stage, have the dark on their back, but it is the nymph stage that actually vectors Babesia. Now, this parasite, this is one of our helmets. And this one has kind of a spaghetti look to it. This is actually in the small intestine. And this is the common roundworm or Ascaris lumbricoides. Normally, we don't see the adult worm, which the female is usually about seven to eight centimeters in length. The male's a little shorter. But what we'll see in the stool sample are these, and this is the egg of the roundworms. This is actually the adults, and we do have two distinct sexes, the females and the males. Some individuals can get high burdens of these worms where we actually will see obstruction of the intestinal tract. Some during the larval stage of this worm, actually the larva will 
go across the mem or across the lining of the intestinal tract and move into other areas and we call this visceral larvae migrants where it can cause injury to other organs this is another common helmet that we see primarily in children and this is Enterobus vermicularis, or the common term for this organism, is called the pinworm. Here are the eggs, and again, it's rare that we see the adults unless we're looking specifically for them. And these are usually somewhere about uh, two to three millimeters in length. But this is the egg, kind of looks like a odd-shaped football. And this is actually the female worms here around the perineal area with the anal opening. When these females get ready to lay their eggs, they will migrate down to the anal opening where they then will lay the eggs, hoping that the eggs will be transmitted outward with the next defecation. So sometimes we actually diagnose this organism with what we call the scotch tape test. If you have a child and you believe that they might have a case of Enterobus vermicularis and you notice that they're scratching their butt, especially when they're sleeping at night, if you can catch them when they start to scratch, because as these females are moving around, they cause perineal itching, you can take some scotch tape, actually put the sticky side down, and sometimes you can actually pull these worms off of the surface of the skin. So it's actually a fairly easy diagnosis to make. This protozoan parasite, we oftentimes worry about insisting in skeletal muscle. And this is called trichinosis. The organism is Trichinella spiralis. The larvae stage will actually insist into the muscle, and we'll see this then in the cut muscle tissue. And this is the male and the female of this organism. The larval stage will migrate from the digestive tract into the muscle, and another person or another host will pick it up from in eating the insisted larva in the muscle. The larva then will hatch out in the digestive tract and finish their development into the male and female reproductive worms. This parasite, you probably would be able to recognize. This is the tapeworm. Most of the ones that infect humans are of the Tania species, and there's a number of them. For example, Tania solium is the pork tapeworm. Tania san saginata is the beef tapeworm. There is a tapeworm unique only to humans. And the way that, again, these are going to be transmitted is through fecal oral contamination. The head of the tapeworm actually contains the scolex. The scolex contains the ring of hooks that will allow this to hook into the mucosal lining of the intestinal tract, and usually four suckers. The suckers actually will suck in nutrients from the surrounding nutrient stream within the intestinal tract. You'll then notice that this is a segmented worm, and each one of these segments eventually matures into what's known as a proglottid. The proglottid actually has both sex organs. Here would be the would be the ovaries and the uterus right here, that line, and out here are the testes. Now, while some of these worms like to get with other worms in order to procreate, they can actually self-fertilize. As the worm grows in length, and some of these worms can become extremely long. I believe the record in human was 36 feet long. These proglottids will break off at the distal end of the worm, and they literally will become egg packets. So here are the individual eggs within the matured proglottid, and this is one of the single eggs. If you look really closely, there are four little lines in here. Those actually will mature into the hooks. What we'll see coming out with the feces then are these proglottids. As they 
are released, there's actually some contractile tissue in the walls, and they kind of look like a little inchworm. But as they dry out, they then begin to look like a little piece of brown rice. And these will be ingested by a new host. This parasite is one of our flukes, and it's the more common fluke that we do see in humans, especially in uh, the United States. And this is the liver fluke caused by, or its scientific name is fasciolo, Fasciola hepatica. This is the worm of the fluke. It actually has a little end on it here called the caper caperculum. And this is actually the fluke in a cut section of liver. Uh, this one actually got cut in half when we cut the liver. So these can actually migrate in through the liver tissue and cause significant damage to the liver. Now, we have several arthropods that actually can cause and or transmit diseases. And this is our first one. And this is one of our mites. And if you count, there's one, two, three, there's a fourth one there, five, six, seven, eight legs. So this is an arachnid since it has the eight legs. And this is Sarcoptes scabii, the causative agent of scabies in humans or sarcoptic mange in animals. These will burrow down into the epidermis of the skin. So this histology section actually shows the mite that's down here within the lower layers of the epidermis. Because of the fact that they burrow and lay their eggs down in the epidermis, and these are the eggs, and those eggs will hatch out and the nymph stage of these organisms actually look a lot like their uh, adult stage, just smaller, they typically cause this, a very, very puritic or itchy rash that can actually uh, have bleeding and crusting. And this is a pretty severe case here in the webbing of the fingers. And the reason it itches so much is because of this. Those little spikes on their back are actually that. They are chitinous spikes, not hairs. But think about having this guy crawling around down in your epidermis, and that irritates your nociceptors, which causes the itching. So this is actually a couple of female uh, sarcoptes mites down here in the epidermis. This organism is a sexually transmitted arthropod, and this is Pythorus pubis, commonly referred to as the crab louse. Six legs, one, two, three, but you'll notice on two of the pair, we have kind of these crab-like structures on the end of the legs. And what these crab-like structures or claw-like structures do is they will hang on to especially coarse hair like pubic hair or eyelashes, eyebrows. And this is actually eyelashes and there's one of the pithorus pubis mites in the eyelash. This arthropod is also one of our insects and this is actually pediculus Capitus. This is the common hair lice or hair louse. Pediculus corpora is the body louse, so they look very, very similar to each other. When they lay their eggs, they will lay their eggs on body hair, and this is of our pediculus capitus, so this is hair of the scalp. And these are what's referred to as the nits. They are attached to the surface of the hair. And so that's why you literally have to comb these things out. And they're highly contagious between uh, hosts. This arthropod causes more irritation than anything, but has been known to, in certain species, to transmit diseases such as Yersinia pestis, which is the plague. And this is the flea. There are several different species of fleas, so we won't talk about the different ones, but all of them have to take a blood meal in order to reproduce. 
It typically is the saliva in the flea bite that causes the inflammation and itching that can occur with these. And this is a common cat flea. Now, we typically won't get the cat flea, which can infect both dogs and cats, unless the flea actually has no choice but to jump on us. So sometimes if the animal dies and the fleas are still in the environment, they will then start biting the human. When we bought our first house, the previous owner had, had a dog, and about three weeks after we moved in, we both began to notice that there were red bite-like structures on in and around our ankles. And I realized that eh, the previous owner's dogs had fleas, so we had to bomb the house so that we could get rid of the fleas. Most time, fleas actually live most of their life cycle off of their blood meal source. So about 95% of their life cycle is spent out in the environment, in the egg, the larva, and the pupil stage. It is only the adult that needs the blood meal in order to reproduce. This arthropod is one of our arachnids because it does have eight legs, and this is our good old ticks. And we've talked about many, many of the diseases that we can see transmitted by ticks besides just causing the irritation at a bite. Okay. This particular species is the uh, nymph, or sorry, the We'll go through the stages here in just a moment, but this is the two adults, the male, a female and the male, and this is Ixodes scapularis. And here's one of these guys, a female, embedded into the skin, taking the blood meal. There are about 60 to 70 different tick species in the United States. Five of them are known to transmit diseases to humans. And of those five, we have four of them here in southwest Missouri. Exodes scapularis, or the common deer tick. We have the larva, the nymph, the, and the male and female. And this is a gravid female, or a fully fed female that's ready to lay eggs. The common dog tick, Derm Dermacenter verabilis, recognized in the adult as kind of having the white on the abdomen region versus the dark spot against a light brown on the Exodes scapularis. And this is, again, the gravid female. Amabilomium americanum, the lone star tick, recognized in the female by the little white dot right smack in the middle of her abdomen. And then Recyphilus sanguineus, the brown dog tick, which is probably the most common that we see. Uh, they're a little harder to recognize because they typically are completely brown. Uh, they, however, the gravid females tend to be the largest because they take the largest blood meals. All of these are, can transmit different diseases, the rickettsial diseases, certainly Exodes scapularis with Borrelia burgdorferi Lyme disease, as well as several other diseases. If we could kill all of these, we would be great from a disease standpoint. And this, of course, is the mosquito. Most of the mosquitoes are found in the Calicidae family, although there are 50 different species that have been identified in Missouri alone. And again, there's a number of different species. We talked about the Anopheles mosquitoes transmitting um, malaria, but our common mosquitoes that we see in this area, and this is Anopheles, this is a common one that we have here. And the only good mosquito from a disease standpoint is this one. Someone has suggested, why don't we just get rid of all the mosquitoes, either by gassing them or there have been programs where we've released sterile males. The problem is mosquitoes actually form part of the food chain and that could disrupt the ecosystem pretty easily. This arthropod you're not, not as familiar with because it is primarily tropical only. And this is the sand fly. The sand fly actually transmits, though, a disease that we do see here in the U.S. for people that go to these areas that have the sand flies. And this is Leishmaniasis, caused by Leishmania dovani. Causes severe cutaneous lesions, like you see here. 
and can be very difficult to actually get rid of. But uh, there was actually a case that I saw one time on this is killing me. Uh, the folks had gone to Costa Rica, had spent some time down there. Gentleman came back with a lesion on his face that looked kind of like this. And nobody could figure it out, couldn't figure it out. And finally, someone said, have you been outside of the country? And this was years ago. And he said, yeah, I've been in Costa Rica. And of course, they immediately knew it was leishmaniasis. Now, the last two arthropods here that we'll talk about actually do not carry diseases, but they are important from the fact that they produce venoms. And this little girl right here, the black widow spiders called Lactrodictus macatans, recognized by the uh, red hourglass on her abdomen. Uh, this is a southern black widow. The northern black widow actually has red dots along the abdomen. These spiders actually produce a neurotoxin that can affect the nervous system. And this is the bite wound. These actually have large uh, fangs on them. And there's one fang, there's the other fang. And so you can actually see large uh, fang structures in the bite. Uh, most of the time, these overwinter in our old barns and our other facilities. Uh, I actually, in opening our neighborhood pool a couple years ago, I found two of these in the filters of the pool. Uh, and we got them out and killed them. And so there again, you can see those fang marks, so a fairly large bite wound. And then this spider, called the brown recluse, or Loxacillus reclusa, is identified by this structure right here on its thorax. And if you kind of notice, that looks like a violin or a fiddle. So some folks in this region call them fiddlebacks. They're not a large spider, but they have fairly long legs. And so you can see sitting here on this quarter, their, their limb spread is a little bit larger than a quarter, about a 50 cent piece. And usually as long as you leave these guys alone, they'll leave you alone. But they do produce a venom that is both cytotoxic and hemolytic. And what this will cause is necrosis at the bite wound. And this can be severe necrosis sometimes, as you can see in this one. So lots and lots of necrotic material, and that's very difficult to actually heal fairly well. There have been instances, certainly, of uh, younger individuals or people with immune compromising situations or older individuals actually dying from the cytotoxic and hemolytic bite wounds from the brown recluse. So they like dark areas like attics, basements. So if you're unpacking your Christmas stuff that's been sitting down in the basement for a year, just be aware that these spiders might be there. And so make sure that you just don't put your hand in, but be careful in digging out any packing material. So this was just a brief uh, overview of some of the protozoan parasites, helmets, and our arthropods that can cause and or transmit diseases. And is it the end? Well, no, not really, because guess what? We have even these guys in southwest Missouri. We have a common scorpion in this area. Again, most of the time the sting is uh, simply going to cause irritation more than anything, but can cause a lot of tissue damage and inflammation from these guys. They tend to kind of like rocky areas along the lakes and rivers, so just be aware that these guys are out there. So on that lovely note, have a great day.